Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist and also a PhD student specialising and studying the evolution of lorica's catfishes. So they're also known as plecos within the aquarium trade and I've moved position away from my main desk um, because I've got some reasonable examples in this tank that are more obvious, that tank they're a lot more elusive. So in this tank I have um, Barium cistrus chrysolemus, so this is my larger female, ignore the sticks, that's um, from some plants that are still in a bulb. Um, so you've got Barium cistrus chrysolemus, also known as the mango magnum pleco. Uh, here you probably can't see, that's a Barium cistrus SPL322 I think, um, along those lines then we've got two gold nuggets, we've got ba the Barren Sister of Santella, so uh, this one might have been an 18, might be an um, L177, this one is more of an um, 81, but they're not really showing, and I do have two other Barren Sisters Christ elements that are not out at the moment, probably because I'm moving around a lot. So also you can see they do have tank mates in the aquarium and this that's one of the biggest topics that a lot of people ask about what they can actually keep with their lower cards. And discus maybe aren't the best examples because they take a bit of work. But now today this topic is going to be about why you shouldn't actually get a pleco. And I probably sound like one of the sort of people that's least going to say that, but they are maybe a little different to how a lot of people perceive them because they're not a clean up crew at all. So one of the major reasons not to get a pleco is their diet. So there are around 1,040 currently described species. There are a lot more undescribed that are kept in the hobby and this does cause a lot of issues with understanding them. But that does mean that because of that diversity, many are living in the same space and they will have vastly different diets. Well, there will be a range of different diets. The majority are detritivores and algivores, which means that they're probably most difficult to actually cater for in captivity given that algae's most diets contain very few of those. And when it comes to other constituents of um, all for which uh, periplankton that come along with those algae, um, they're almost unseen of it within the aquarium foods and aquariums grow very little and just because they feed on it, it doesn't mean they all will feed on every algae and every biofilm. You might notice that in very, um, different ones of my tanks um, from videos, there is biofilm growth, there is algae growth, they do partition their niches, different species will feed on different algae and different bacteria and different uh, microbes of different kinds to different proportions. And this does mean that th just having algae in the aquarium, having biofilms, doesn't mean they're going to eat it. And quite a few biofilms I find, especially those on freshwood, I've only seen snails eat. And even in the wild, if they're recorded as a cyanobacteria eater, it doesn't actually mean they're going to be feeding on the cyanobacteria that really plagues aquariums and I find quite the opposite, they're not the biggest fans of them. And the same for diatoms. So their diets do make them a bit of a pain to keep. This also provides an issue where it does make them a little bit more expensive when it comes to algae diets because you're buying a diet high in that those ingredients which cost more and therefore Rapashi Solent Green is probably and super green is probably one of the few that you can rely on. Uh, bulking it out is definitely possible. I add in extra algae to mine, uh, so algal powders. Enough that will hold together but not um, like too little, just to bulk out. Um, I don't know how much algae it would have in total from that. Um, because I've not calculated the percentages. But definitely those algivores, the tritivores ones are going to be a little bit more of a challenge. Then you've got those, the carnivores. So carnivores kind of can be partitioned a little bit. There's um, sort of mostly invertivores. Some specialise a little bit more in insects and others more mollusks. We don't entirely know the full extent. 
or even all the species contained within it. So they're probably the easiest to cater for and reflect maybe what you're feeding your fish more if you're feeding a insect based diet which would be ideal um, whereas if you're feeding fish these fish don't feed on fish in the wild um, and that can easily lead to bloat and other related issues oh just check it oh there's a massive snare at the end of her chosen cave for the moment so Diets, obviously, they're probably the most interesting aspect, though, because there's so much variation you can do. It does mean that for even larger species, it does limit tank mates because they're so slow to feed. Um, they're not going to compete with anything that's particularly fast. They take their time, and that does mean you're having food there, and it's probably going to have to sit there a few hours. Um, it depends on the age, the species, where you put the food, what food and vegetables are not a solution for this because very few actually feed on plants in the wild and algae are very different nutritionally from traditional plants. So the next reason you probably shouldn't get a pleco is a lot of aquariums do not provide enough current or flow in the aquarium. So this I've actually turned off this internal that I use kind of as a power head for now. Um, and that's because, oh is it, no, no it is off, um, and that's because a lot of these fishes are from areas of very high currents, they're not found in, well often, some teriopithic these are, in stagnant waters, uh, well they're definitely not stagnant but lower flow, a lot of the water bodies they come from has a higher current than any aquarium, apart from maybe panta rays, um, a river manifold tank so they need those oxygen levels that it replicates the natural environment but more importantly a lot of species are adapted for higher temperatures a lot of the ones we keep and you need that flow to maintain those high oxygen levels this does mean that they're probably actually not that great if you're dealing with um, plants and stuff and this comes on to the second element, which is the temperature. Law codes are diverse in the temperatures, or plecos are diverse in the temperatures they, are, they prefer. A lot of what people say fancy ones do prefer those high, or do need those high temperatures, 28C or above, which limits tank mates massively. It's more expensive on the cost of the energy bill, and also you want to maintain those higher oxygen levels makes them more suitable like with discus but it depends what you're feeding the discus as well if you're going to be using beef art and they're going to be eating the beef art keep well away but there the temperatures do contrast with a lot of fishes corridoras being one for many um common corridoras and for the majority of popular laurel cards um and also quite a few other things like Danio, but there are also cooler water species like Ketostoma, they're very tolerant, a wide range of temperatures. There's sort of the mid range of Panaculus, uh, depends on the Panaculus, and Picoltia, stuff like that. And there's many widespread species as well, which makes them, or well, shows how adaptable they are, and also a lot of people don't know which variant they're buying anyway. So one of the most probably annoying things if you like your pretty aquariums is these guys need caves, they need hiding places and a lot of them and if they don't have them they make their own, if they don't like them they make their own, that means they do dig up plants these ones plants will not set, stay in the substrate with them um, especially her, but also some of the larger bands they just can throw their weight around pretty well like that so, and yeah, they just, the, these caves are ideal, particularly if you're wanting to spawn them, but if not, but they'd be stressed without those hiding spaces, and it might not fit into your aesthetic, it's not, but planted tanks do not provide those hiding spaces. If you look at the habitats of many of these species, especially the Hypostominae subfamily, they're not found in those planted uh, sort of garden like habitats that's more for like hyperpotomine so the autosynclus and stuff but they still want a good current 
and because as you can tell there they like those hiding spots one of the major reasons I would say don't get a pleco is because that's what they really enjoy doing is hiding and while some might come out and some species are more likely to not be worried about sort of approaching people being around uh, the front of the glass and not spooked as easily a lot of popular species are so these guys they're not too bothered by me but this is because I've had well he's I've only had him about just under a year but the others I've had her two years another one I've had another one or two I've had uh, four years it's difficult to remember and similar of that tank they're used to me they used to my movements around the tank but if you have say children running around or sudden movements they might not come out there are better species for it um, a better genera like Otocinclus maybe they're a bit more diet dietarily they're a bit more uh, difficult but they're, I, they're great fishes anyway just there's a lot of considerations and they do limit what you can keep in the tank remember this group is exclusive to South America they are not found in the Rift Valley Rift Valley has plenty of algae eaters it's got Otto Sinclair it's got Malawi cichlids such as um, I guess Nubuna I guess I'm a Lunacara um, and then it's got Synodontis um, in surrounding areas. I guess there, some of those might feed on algae um, but in the Congo you've got Bichardi, Shatadenai and then I think there's some Chyloglanus, Chyloglanus in the lakes themselves and obviously Trophius, there's plenty of fishes that feed on algae and low cards are not one of them because they're not found in Africa apart from invasive Teoblichthys so it does limit your stocking of the aquarium massively and what fish you can keep with them um, particularly if you have your eye on a particular species these guys are high temperature so that's limiting um, the size the bulk they're still territorial and yeah she will even lunge at the discus if they um, come near her when she's eating or when she's out and not having to look keep an eye on me she will lunge at them she can't be kept of anything slow moving that won't move away so banjo catfishes uh, boon receptors are no go um, small law cars that won't like dash out the way um, so that's the same even for the gold nuggets um, the baron sisters and Thelis, because I've even seen that individual there has rammed a panaculus of the same size into a cave. They can be nasty fishes, but then there's some that, or quite a few that are social as well. But the final thing I'd say about plecos is if you really want to get into them, if you're really interested in them, is that they do require maybe a little bit more attention to science. A lot of species do not have common names or common names are shared between multiple species who might have totally different size requirements, totally different care requirements, diets, whatever. And so Snowball is the best example of this. Snowball Pleco covers hypensitious, multiple hypensitious species and also covers uh, a barren citrus L142 which gets the same size as this girl can get, so um, 24 centimetres, 30 centimetres standard length. It's a bulky fish, totally different diet, totally different requirements in general, totally different ease of keeping. These guys are a nightmare to um, keep. And it kind of makes it much more difficult that there's not, but you can't be, these common names aren't designed for the common names are largely for I guess certain people but there isn't the common names for a lot of species a lot of species that aren't described they might have scientific names they might have L numbers which is a whole other topic they might have just a vague common name they might not have anything and the problem is if you're working on common names or you're not willing to go further then you're going to get into a big rut with the amount of bycatch there is, the amount of misidentification there is, 
Um, and you really need to start, uh, the big thing with plecos is you need to start uh, being able to identify even loosely because anything can get mislabeled. Uh, my flash pleco Panaculus um, albivermis was sold as a Panaculus macus. That was a really good deal though because Panaculus albivermis is usually like at the moment about 50 pounds, 50, 60 pounds for an adult and I got him for 20. So it is really good for deals but you can also find some real oddities but it does mean that you do kind of need to go a bit above and beyond much earlier than maybe other groups of fishes like you could get away with either of this because you don't need to know their scientific names because they're either hybrids or you're dealing maybe with uh, Symphyzidon Tarzu um, or Symphyzidon Heckel a Symphyzidon Acrofasciatus I guess but it doesn't really make much of a difference and the common names are, are there Whereas with Laura Cards, the, the common names, many don't even have common names. And it's, especially when the common names, like one species might have multiple common names, it causes such an issue. Uh, all I can think of is not a Laura Card at all, but Bala Shark, Silver Shark, Copper Tetra, um, Silver Tip Tetra, two different species, but they've got multiple common names um, so people don't know whether they're talking about the same thing but so you kind of if you get my drift of that sort of discussion on why you need to learn maybe be a little bit more scientific about it and there's actually loads of science on them and it makes it really interesting because you can't ever stop learning about them. There's websites just entirely for discussing this. Um, like there's so many catfish websites on different topics. So you don't even, for the care of them, it depends on the species, but you almost don't need to go down scientific papers as much until you reach a certain level, especially when it comes to say, um, oh, do I, I don't have a great example, because <laughs> I've got quite a few undescribed species, but um, I today at looking at uh, Lamentichthys, which is a long whiptail uh, low card, a long whiptail pleco, looking at the scientific description of which species is which, because the website didn't include it, a lot of aquarium websites, and that's how you can catch some really oddities but definitely that's beware of getting into lower cards because they're a lot more in depth than they look and it's one of those hobbies where you see people getting into the science a lot more than oh, I guess they're also not aesthetic because that is not a beautiful tank that is just a tank um, yeah, especially like, even above, this is just one aerial root's gone in, that's a plant that was so long I just trailed in, but they're, you, they're not really the aesthetic fish, so I think everyone that gets into them goes in for a different reason, because they're just interesting fish. Anyway, I'm going to end this video here, and thank you for watching.